All right, today I have the great honor of introducing progressive of a, a, one of our great progressive champions in the U.S. Senate, Senator Sherrod Brown. He was elected to the Ohio House of Representatives in 74 after knocking on 20,000 doors. And that's the kind of retail politician he is. And he has, throughout his career, taught his fellow politicians how modern populist populism can work as a way to get elected and as a strategy for taking America forward. He was elected to Congress in 1993 and he's always been an independent progressive voice. Sherrod's victory over Senator Mike DeWine in the crucial 2006 dem elections demonstrated that uh, progressive populists could beat Karl Rove's playbook. DeWine and Rove wanted every Ohio voter to know that Sherrod was a proud social liberal and they, they, they really spread that word. But Sherrod aggressively let every voter know that he was also for blue collar jobs and against NAFTA style trade deals and he let them know he was for working people and for raising the minimum, wa minimum wage and he crusaded against conservative moves to cut overtime pay and against tax cuts for the super rich. Sherrod showed other Democrats how to campaign in a way that won support from women and minorities and the normal Democratic base, but he also won 57% of male voters in Ohio and 53% of white male voters in Ohio. Talk about expanding the Democratic electorate. Senator Brown not only taught the other 2006 election, uh, senators how to win, he has also been a leader among all of the senators uh, in, that, uh, in that body. On the important issue of trade, he has been a leader. You should get his book, The Myths of Free Trade. And on health care, he led in the Senate with a statement that has been circulating for the last several months, insisting that public insurance option must be an essential part of health care reform. That has really transformed the debate in the U.S. Senate. That statement has now been, been signed by over 30 uh, senators in a matter of weeks. And health reformers uh, are assured that we're not going to let the special interests cut the heart out of the Obama health care plan. Uh, this is an ongoing battle, and Sherrod Brown has really provided the leadership to make sure that, that the right thing is going to be done in the U.S. Senate and Senator Kennedy's uh, new bill reflects Sherrod's leadership. We asked Sherrod to come and talk with us about the prospects for change and how they look in the U.S. Senate and how a new American populist progressivism can work uh, with the new administration uh, with an outside-inside uh, alliance. So without further ado, please welcome Senator Sherrod Brown. Roger, thank you. It's just, it's a pleasure to be here I'm, I'm to speak to America's premier progressive organization. Thank you so very much for the work that all of you do. Roger and Bob Borsage and Ann Hess and so many of you that, that are leaders in the progressive movement around the country. And we're, you know, we, we, we talk from time to time before this 2006 election when, when voters said stop to the, to the conservative Reagan era in 2008 when voters said let's start a new progressive era. We talked about the history of the progressive eras in this country and in the 1930s and the 1960s and now again we have such opportunity because of the leadership of so many of you. Your activism, you're working so hard in the trenches when we weren't winning elections, your involvement uh, in so many ways, so many grassroots ways, financial ways, speaking out, writing, all the, the intellectual part of the movement, everything you're doing is so very, very important. So um, thank you for, for your activism that way and changing this country. Um, 
My, uh, and, and thank you, Roger, for your comments about, about the public option. I want to talk about that in a moment. We had a meeting at the White House yesterday, the Democrats on the HELP Committee, the, the Kennedy Committee, which I sit on, Health, Education, Labor, Pension Committee, and the, um, the Finance Committee. The Finance Committee is clearly a little more conservative than the HELP Committee. Um, and the meeting with the President was just outstanding, talking about what we're going to do in health care. And I'll talk more about that in a moment. But um, it's, uh, it's clearly, I mean, every time's an historic time, but this is an historic time that we're going to move forward in doing what we, so many of us, so many of you in this room have done for decades. I, um, I, I, and I apologize for those that have heard me talk about this, I wear in my lapel a, a pen depicting a canary in a birdcage. It was given to me at a Workers' Memorial Day rally about 10 years ago. Every, every April, um, many in organized labor uh, celebrate Workers' Memorial Day, a day to honor workers who have been injured or killed on the job. And this canary in a birdcage was given to me to symbolize the mine workers taking the canary down in the mines 100 years ago. If the canary died from toxic gas or lack of oxygen, the mine worker got out of the mine, knew he had, he was, he had, he had no, no one to look out for him. The government, the, the, there, was, the, there was no union strong enough or government that cared enough um, to look out for him. He was on his own. And you look in those, in those days, around the turn of the last century, 100 years or so years ago, um, and uh, a baby, a child born in this country in, to say, the year 1900 had a life expectancy of about 45. Today, a child born in the United States will live at least three, on the average, will live three decades longer than that because of, because of the progressive movement, because of Medicare and Social Security. Not, you know, heart transplants and chemotherapy matters to extend life for, for many people, but in terms of the, all of us at large as a society, it's Medicare and Social Security and worker safety and, and child, the ban on child labor and women's rights and civil rights and safe drinking water and clean air and seat belts and airbags and all the things that progressives have fought for, always against the opposition of the privilege in this society. None of these battles were won because politicians are kind-hearted, but they were won because of the pressure <clears throat> that the progressive movement put on, put on state legislatures, on county courthouses on, on the U.S. Congress uh, to change this world. And that's why we have longer, healthier lives in this country. And that's what we're going to see. We're going to see forward movement again this year. I, um, um, I, my, my, mother, my mother grew up in a, in a small town in Georgia in a, in a world in which she saw injustice and knew she needed uh, to do something about it. It was a lesson she imparted, even though she, she met my dad in this city at the, at the, um, uh, at the Mayflower Hotel, at the Willard Hotel, excuse me, during World War II, and my dad was coming back from overseas, this small woman from small town, town called Mansfield, Georgia. My dad was from Mansfield, Ohio, and they met and moved to Mansfield, Ohio. And, and um, my, mom, my mom recently, at the age of 88, passed away, and I want to tell you a story about her that that might be funny, but may, may be a lesson too. She was she was very healthy. She was doing well until last December, and she had been she was with Senator Obama very early in the presidential race. Um, she, uh, she way before almost anybody I knew. She was um, she ran the senior citizens levy in November of '08 uh, in Richland County, and of course it won because she was running it, and she knows how to do this stuff really really well. She got sick in December. We had her in, in home for the last um, at her home for the last few weeks of her life. Um, she wanted to live until the inauguration, and she did. She, that was one of her last really good days to be able to watch first African American um, sworn in as president of the United States. And about a week before she died, she, we were all with her, my wife and I, my brothers and their wives, um, pretty much every day the last several weeks. And, and uh, about a week before she died, she asked me to sing to her um, a, a Lutheran hymnal. We grew up in the Lutheran church, and she asked me to. So I went in the other room and got a Lutheran hymn book, got our Lutheran hymn book out, and I sang a song that I will not share with you, but I sang a song, um, Beautiful Savior, and sang three or four verses. And, and she, she kind of lay there, and she smiled, and then paused a moment, and then in her very sweet Georgia accent, she said, um, she said, that was really good. And she paused a minute, minute again, and then she said, but you know, you sound a lot better in a group. <laughs> and so there's a lesson for that. And um, perhaps that, that, I mean, perhaps my, I mean, it's all, we always sound better in a group, perhaps, but the, and, and perhaps maybe my, my, my voice is an acquired taste, too. I, I understand that. But, but the, the Democratic Convention, this is a true story. My, my wife, Connie, um, 
who is a Pulitzer Prize writer. Her name is Connie Schultz. If you haven't read her, go on the internet. She writes for The Plain Dealer. She's a terrific writer. And she won the Pulitzer because of her writing for, for as it said, her pungent um, outspokenness for the underdog was what she won the Pulitzer for in her 10 columns that they chose. But she and I were in Denver at the Democratic Convention, and we were in a very crowded restaurant. Um, there, been, in, there were four or five senators there th to thank a group of, of Democratic contributors for their support. And we were all squeezed together, and each of us took a chance speaking, Senator Conrad, Senator Sanders, Senator Casey, Senator Menendez and I. And when I had the microphone, I was speaking, this guy who was kind of crowded in next to my wife as she was standing out in the audience, this is a fairly small restaurant, it's much, much smaller than this room. This guy turned to my wife, and it's a true story, and she said, he said to her, he said, I can't stand that guy's voice. <laughs> and, um, and Connie said, really? And he said, he said, yeah, when he speaks, it's like, it's like fingernails on a blackboard. She said, and you know, he obviously knew who she was, and she said, you know, I like his voice. And the guy says, you like his voice? She said, yeah, you know what, I really like his voice. And the, she kind of goes like this, the guy leans forward and said, I really like his voice when he wakes me up in the middle of the night and says, I love you, baby. <laughs> and um, the, guy, the guy just said, you, 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 you're, you're his wife? And he, she said, yeah. And he was, he was gone so fast out of that restaurant. So I never did find out who it was. He's probably some guy who lives in Washington that, I don't know, whatever, whoever it was. But um, I, I, one, one, this is, for the first time in a decade, and maybe, maybe longer than that, um, we have a real opportunity in Congress to, to rebuild the middle class, to provide opportunity to those who aspire to the middle class, to do all the kinds of things that, that we've tried to do for some time. I, I, um, my first, actually before I sworn into the Senate, um, Senator Kennedy chose two freshmen to sit on his Health, Education, Labor, Pension Committee back in uh, December of 2006, Bernie Sanders and me. And he, he knew both of us from our work in the House and knew that we would be progressives and fight for the same social and economic economic justice issues he did. So the first, right after being selected this committee, where uh, Senator Kennedy has us to his house in Georgetown. I'd never been to Senator Kennedy's house in Georgetown, so of course I went, and it was for the Democratic members. And we're, we go into the dining room, we're sitting at the table, and I'm at the end of the table. Um, and to my left, along this side, there was all the Democratic members of this committee. To the left were Senator Kennedy, Hillary Clinton, Barack Obama, and Bernie Sanders. And so I turned to Bernie in a fairly loud stage whisper and said, Bernie, what the hell are we doing here, man? And you know, now we're beginning to find out what, what Bernie Sanders is doing, what um, Ted Kennedy's doing, what this committee's doing. <laughs> and it's, you know, er early this session, we passed the economic stimulus package, as you know. We expanded the children's health insurance plan program. It had been vetoed by, by the former president. Of course, Senator President Obama signed it. We passed the Lilly Ledbetter Fair Pay Act. Again, it had been vetoed by the former president. This president signed it. We're working to find clean energy sources of sufficient scale before we destroy the planet for our grandchildren or mortgage our future to hostile countries. In my state, we're finally establishing a clean energy industry and to provide more good jobs and free ourselves permanently from the dependence on foreign oil. And that's just where we begin with this progressive agenda. We have obviously have so much more to do. Let me give you a couple other examples. Before the end of the year, we, we need to get the banks out of the student lending business uh, with the tens of billions of dollars in with the tens of billions of dollars in savings we can get by we can in from, from taking away those subsidies for the banks, we can increase Pell Grants, put more money into, into, into funding highly qualified low-income and middle-income students so they can afford college without being saddled with tens and tens and tens of thousands of dollars debt when, they're, um, when they finish. We can revamp our trade policy, the Trade Act, which um, Roger mentioned, which I authored in Congress in the last couple of years, would, man would mandate trade pact reviews and help restore congressional oversight of future trade agreements, and most importantly, we're going to find a way, and it's going to happen this year, to provide, ensure affordable health care for all Americans. This afternoon, um, I will sit down with Chairman Kennedy and my colleagues from, from that dinner I mentioned of a couple of years ago, minus two of them, of course, uh, to, who have moved on to bigger and better jobs, to walk through a plan to bring quality, affordable health care to all Americans. Uh, and yesterday, let me talk about the meeting with the President yesterday. Yesterday, the meeting, um, the President asked the members of both committees to come to the, to the White House. We had a, about an hour and a half, very substantive meeting where he asked very, I mean, he, he talked for five minutes, then 
he answered and, and commented, answered questions and commented on our comments of the, of the 20 or so senators there and the two committees. Uh, there was um, overwhelming sentiment, uh, a strong, strong message. Um, his public support for the public option, we knew from the campaign, he reiterated that. Um, and he saw, and other perhaps wavering Democrats on that issue saw the overwhelming support of, of members of the Senate, Democratic members of the Senate for the public option. Uh, the, as, as, as Roger mentioned, I introduced a resolution a couple of weeks ago. We had done a letter first, sent a resolution calling for a public option. Um, and uh, 28 senators signed on to that resolution, including almost the entire HELP committee, several from the, from the um, uh, Finance Committee, and most of the Democratic leadership, pretty much all the Democratic leadership. Harry Reid doesn't normally sign on to things like that, but he's clearly supportive of the public option, too. Uh, and, and, you know, when you, when you look at the, the health insurance, imme immediately, as soon as we introduced our bill, the health insurance lobbyists began, health insurance lobby began their efforts to call up senators on my resolution Solution and try to talk them into getting off it. I mean, they are, they are going to fight public option like nobody's business. That's why the work that you're doing is so, so important. And, you know, they talk about competition being a good thing until they're the ones who have to do it. Uh, private, insurance comp comp private insurance competition in so many places really is an oxymoron. In Ohio, the two largest insurance companies account for 58% of the market. In some Ohio cities, it's almost 9 out of 10. And just to, 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 to look at our health insurance system and what we've wrought in the last many years, let me, let me give you one set of statistics. I don't, won't overdo this, but there was, um, there was a survey not too long ago of the 13 richest countries in the world, um, industrial democracies, France, Germany, the U.S., Canada, Israel, Japan, countries, uh, Germany, Italy, well, all the countries like that. And, and, um, they ask a series, they, they rated all these countries in a series of, of, of in, uh, indices of, of various, various um, issues such as um, life expectancy, maternal mortality, infant mortality, immunization rates, um, about a dozen indices to, to measure our, our progress on, on health in our countries. Um, the United States ranked 12th out of 13th overall. No surprise, you've heard that before. But what's most interesting about that, I mean, that's most interesting. What's second most interesting about that survey is in one category, the United States ranked almost at the top. And that category was life expectancy at 65. So if you get to be 65 in the United States of America, um, you, are, you, you are likely to live a longer, healthier life, more likely than, than in almost any country in the world. Um, but that aside, there is, you know, there's clear opposition to what we're trying to do, and that's why your, your efforts are so important in the public option. But in, and we know in, every, every, in our nation's history, every time health care reform was introduced, the cries of government takeover, socialized medicine um, were just overwhelming. Uh, in 1948, in the 1940s, when Harry Truman tried to do, tried to do Medicare in those days, in 1965, um, the, the, the same outcry of socialized medicine, government takeover, uh, were, those same cries were heard in 1965 with President Johnson in signing of the Medicare passage and signing of the Medicare bill. Sixteen years ago when I first came to Congress in 1993, we heard those same cries. And that's what the insurers are claiming today. Um, just last month, leaders of the Republican Party debated amidst two wars, the worst economic environmental crisis of our, of our lifetimes. Uh, they debated whether they would adopt a resolution branding their counterparts as, that's us, as the Democratic Socialist Party. You remember that. Who said the Republicans were out of ideas? But this year, this year is going to be different. In spite of their accusations of socialized medicine, in spite of their outcries uh, that of government takeover, this year is going to be different. And this only happened because you have all built the movement uh, to move forward in that way. And that's that's why I am uh, the the president. Without without um, you know the, the president was very def definitive yesterday. Um, as Democratic leaders in the House and Senate are that this bill is going to happen this year. There is, we're going to, we're beginning the, the walk through of the bill this week. We started yesterday on, on the prevention side of the bill. We're going to talk about access and quality issues today and tomorrow. We're going to walk, that's the, the Democrats are walking through the bill and, and, and doing some rewrites before it's 
before the first initial introduction is finalized, if you will. And the next couple of weeks, two weeks from now, we're likely to do the markup of the bill. Probably will take a full week, maybe longer in both committees. We'll pull them together. The president wants this legislation on the floor and passed by the end of July, the 1st of August, before the August recess. He said to us he wants to sign the bill in October, and then he turned to all of us, all 20, and he said, and he holds up a pen, and he said, and there's going to be a signing pen for each of you. So which is a nice sign. It's kind of an inside baseball thing, but nonetheless. So, um, and let me close with this. I'm, today I'm launching a, um, a web page that will allow, allow you to share with me your stories about, about our healthcare system. Um, visit my, visit my web page, if you would, it's brown.senate.gov, where you can either write me a story or um, send me a video of somebody you know that's, that's struggling or somebody, uh, a, a great story about somebody that's, that's done very well with healthcare, whatever, whatever story you would like to share with us. Also starting today, and I will, I will be posting those stories and some my responses to them when applicable to my website I'm on a regular basis. Starting today, I will begin using Twitter as part of my Senate communications. Um, that, yeah, that may not, thank you, <laughs> that may not mean much, that may not be, be momentous to many of you, but it's quite a step for somebody whose generation knows a whole lot more about books than we do blogs, so I appreciate that. Um, Twitter's tagline asked, I'm just learning this stuff, so bear with me. Twitter's tagline asked the question, what are you doing? Um, I know none of you really want to know what I had for breakfast, although it was yogurt and grape nuts today. But um, you do want to know, or I think you want to know, and, and people should know what their members of Congress are doing to help turn around this country, what we're doing about health care, what we're doing, uh, what, how we're sharing our values and what our values are um, that matter in this country. I invite everyone to join me on Twitter. It's twitter.com slash SEN, Senator Sherrod Brown, SEN, S-H-E-R-R-O-D-B-R-O-W-N. As the Senate slowly gives approval in its sort of lethargic, sometimes dysfunctional way to enter the electronic world, uh, more channels, including Facebook, will follow. Um, there's there, and we can, again, use that as the Obama campaign used so much, um, so much of Facebook and so much of YouTube um, to, to, to build that campaign effort in ways that, that nobody had ever seen before. There's much work to do. There's much cause for hope. Just over a closing, just over 77 years ago, Franklin Roosevelt addressed the class of 1932 my mother, in, in, in a small college in Georgia. My mother was then 12 years old, living in a small town in Georgia. His task wasn't an easy one, to give hope to young people beginning careers at the worst moment possible. He began by describing his analysis of the problem. Our basic trouble was not an insufficiency of capital, he said. It was an insufficient distribution of buying power coupled with an over-sufficient speculation and production. We accumulated such a superabundance of capital that our great bankers were vying with each other, some of them employing questionable methods in their efforts to lend their capital at home and abroad. Sound familiar? FDR's prescription was this, this country needs, and unless I mistake its temper, the country demands bold, persistent experimentation. It's common sense to take a method and try it. If it fails, admit it frankly and try another. But above all, try something. The millions who are in want will not stand by silently forever while the things to satisfy their needs are within easy reach. In short, FDR told those graduates in Georgia that we must keep trying and we must keep trying together. Or as another Georgian might say, we all sound better in a group. Thank you. Thank you, Senator Sherrod Brown, progressive champion.